the scriptures say, Praise ye the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. The works of the Lord are great, sought out of all them that have pleasure therein. His work is honourable and glorious, and his righteousness endureth forever. He hath made his wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. Let us come before the throne of grace together. Let us pray. Almighty God and our loving, gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank thee and praise thee for another opportunity to come into thy holy and glorious presence. And, O Lord, we know that thou art worthy to receive blessing and honour and glory and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure and praise they are and were created. And we worship thee, the one who made heaven and earth, and everything in them thou didst speak, and it was so. Thou hast commanded, and it stood firm. Thou art indeed a great and mighty God. And we will come this night acknowledging our great need of thee, our sin before thee, and we will plead that we might know what it is to find mercy in thy sight, and we plead only the merit and shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is the new and living way, and how we praise thee and thank thee for him. And Lord, on this thy day, give us all thy special help in our worship of thee, be with us as we gather together as a company of thy people. For, Lord, if thy presence does not go up with us, then surely, O Lord, we come in vain. Give us grace, O God, to draw near to thee with singleness of heart and full assurance of faith. We ask that thou wouldst meet us with thy blessing. Be present in the midst of thy people. Show thy saving grace through the prayers offered, the singing of praises, the reading of thy word, the preaching of thy word. O oh Lord, we ask that thou wouldst overcome and help us many weaknesses and the sins that so easily distract us. We pray that thy word would come with life and power to our souls. May it be like good seed sown in good soil. And we pray that our prayers and praises would be spiritual sacrifices acceptable in thy sight only through thine own Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. We'll sing together our first psalm this evening, Psalm 66, Psalm 66 and verses 1 through 7, Psalm 66, 1 through 7, and the tune is Crediton, and that is number 49.
I'd like you to turn in God's word to our first reading this evening, which is Psalm 16. Psalm 16. And we'll read through the psalm together. Psalm 16. Preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust. O my soul, thou hast said unto the Lord, Thou art my Lord. My goodness extendeth not to thee, but to the saints that are in the earth, and to the excellent in whom is all my delight. Their sorrows shall be multiplied that hasten after another God. Their drink offerings of blood will I not offer, nor take up their names into my lips. The Lord is the portion of mine inheritance and of my cup. Thou maintainest my lot. The lines are fallen unto me in pleasant places. Yea, I have a goodly heritage. I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel. My reins also instruct me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine Holy One to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures for evermore. Amen. Well, let us sing together again, and this time Psalm 119, and we'll sing from verse 41 through verse 48. Psalm 119, beginning at verse 41, and the tune is Kilmarnock, which is number 75.
please take God's word in your hand for our second reading this evening, which is in the Gospel of Matthew and Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. And we shall read the whole of the chapter together. Matthew 6. Take heed that ye do not your arms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore when thou doest thine arms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest arms, let not their left hand know what thy right hand doeth that thine arms may be in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. After this manner therefore pray ye, our Father which art in Heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head and wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast but unto thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, There will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, 
or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Amen. And may the Lord help us as we come to his word together. Well, let us come before the throne of grace in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God and our loving, gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank thee and praise thee once again for this glorious privilege of being able to commune with you and to call upon thee, our Heavenly Father. And Lord, we come with thanksgiving in our hearts and we praise and thank thee that thou hast been pleased to reveal thyself to us, that thou hast revealed thy power and the reality uh, that is there that thou art God. And Lord, we will be still before thee and know indeed that thou art the Lord. And Lord, we thank thee that thou hast revealed thyself in creation, but thou hast also revealed thyself to us, the mighty revelation of the word of God, so that we may not doubt thine own existence or thy character, thine attributes or purposes or desires. Thou hast spoken in such a manner that we can come before thee with great assurance and resting on thy promises. And yet, Lord, we thank thee and we praise thee that thou hast most wonderfully revealed thyself to us in the person of thy Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank thee that in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And we thank thee that he has come and that in him we find wonderful, pardoning love, free forgiveness and life everlasting. And we thank thee for thy sustaining hand in our lives and how thou hast given us this time again on thy day to draw near, to hear thy word, to consider eternity, to consider our souls. O Lord, who are we that thou shouldst think upon us? And what is more, O Lord, who are we that thou shouldst grant us to see ourselves as we really are, sinners in desperate need, and then to show us the only way in which we can be saved, to know thee and to walk with thee, through Jesus Christ, to know thee and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent, O Lord, what can compare to this? And then, O Lord, to have such security in thee, we stand in awe of thine infinite knowledge and wisdom. And Lord, we will confess that so often in our lives we find ourselves perplexed or confused or uncertain. And yet, Lord, when we think on thee, thou art filled with answers. We can rest in thee. There are no mysteries for thee. There is nothing that thou dost not know, nor any problem that cannot be solved by thee, nor events that cannot be explained by thee. O oh Lord, no hypocrisy which thou dost not see. O oh Lord, we pray that thou wilt grant us to see thine omniscience, thine all-knowing mind, together with thy power and grace. O oh Lord, we thank thee that all of these things make thee utterly trustworthy. Thy counsel takes all things into account. Thy good plan will never be thwarted by unseen events, for thou art the sovereign God, and we can trust in thee. O oh Lord, we pray that thou wouldst help us to live in the light of this. Teach us wisdom, we pray thee, for the lips of the wise truly are a fountain of life. O oh God, we thank thee for the gospel. We thank thee, O oh Lord, that it saves. We thank thee, O oh Lord, that thou art at work even today. And we pray, O Lord, that wherever thy gospel is preached, that thou wouldst be pleased to attend such with the power and unction of the Holy Spirit, that many sinners might be drawn from darkness into thy most glorious light. O Lord, we pray that thou wouldst be pleased to do the work which only thou canst do, that thou wouldst intervene and save those who are lost and dead in sin, and that thou wouldst be pleased to pour out thy Spirit once again, that, Lord, in, even in this land which deserves nothing from thee, that we might see a great turning unto thee. O oh, Lord, we thank thee that we are not without hope. We thank thee for every token of blessing which testifies to thine hand being at work. And, Lord, we pray that thou wouldst be pleased to extend such even in this day and age. O oh, Lord, wouldst thou not come? Wouldst thou not rend the heavens and come down? 
and begin even with us this night, O God, we pray. And Lord, if there are those here this night who do not know thee, O Lord, wouldst thou be pleased to have mercy upon them, to open blind eyes and unstop deaf ears, that, Lord, that thou wouldst grant to them life, and life everlasting in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, I do thank thee and praise thee once again for this place and for this company of thy people here. O Lord, wouldst thou lavish thy blessing upon them, every gospel endeavour. O Lord, wouldst thou be pleased to come and own such, that, Lord, this might be indeed a refuge for those outside, those without Christ, without hope in this world and in the one to come. O Lord, please, we pray, hear our cries. And, Lord, for thy servant who ministers here, we thank thee for him and for his wife. And, Lord, we pray that thou wouldst uphold them and bless them richly, all the uh, prospective plans and that which is there. O God, do be pleased to go before and attend such with thine own blessing. Hear us then, we pray. Point us to thine own Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we ask all of these things now, in and through his all-prevailing name. Amen. Amen. Let us sing together again in this time, Psalm 107. And we'll sing from verse 1 through verse 9. The tune is Naomi, and the tune number is 213. Praise God for he is good for
It really has been a great pleasure to be with you again and to thank you for your kind welcome. And uh, do please be assured, as I mentioned this morning, we do pray for you regularly in the endeavours of this place and pray that the Lord will be pleased to honour the faithful ministry of his word and faithful gospel witness in this part of our country. I'd like our text to be this evening, Matthew 6 and verse 33, a very well-known text. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And really at the end of this chapter in our text, the Lord Jesus Christ is drawing together all the various elements of his teaching that he has been preaching in what many call the Sermon on the Mount, and the Lord has given a clear view of the nature of his kingdom, his purpose in this world, and what he was proposing to accomplish. Now you remember that when our Lord began his public ministry, he, the king, announced the fact that the kingdom had come, and that demanded a response. For example, Mark 1, verses 14 to 15. Now after that, John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent ye and believe the gospel. You know, we live in a day and age when there is great confusion about what Christianity really is. There seems to be so many mixed messages that are sent out to the man, to the woman to the people on the street very little idea about what the true gospel is and so often thoughts are formulated based on what is seen in the media or what is presented as Christianity and so there's much prejudice and misconception and even in the so-called church there is great confusion about the gospel and if you listen to the papers and the popular books and the blogs to the version of Christianity, confusion reigns. But friend, we're not turning to sources like that this evening. We come to the authoritative word of God. And friends, we know nothing about the Lord Jesus Christ apart from what we're told here. Everything else is just conjecture and supposition. We must go back to the scriptures. We must go back to Christ himself. And here we have in his own terms the clear and unmistakable nature of his message. It tells us what the gospel is and how vital it is for us. And so what do we find here? Well, a number of points for us to consider. And the first thing is this, that the gospel is entirely different from everything that appeared before, it is different from everything that men and women believe by nature. You know, if you look at verses 31 to 32 of the passage we read together, the Lord says, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. Now, remember that the Lord was preaching primarily to the Jews. And they had the Old Testament and they regarded themselves as the people of God. And so they had some concern about God and, and things like righteousness. And for them, the world was divided into two categories. You had the Jew and you had the Gentile. You had those who they thought had true religion and those who did not. You know, it's a bit of a helpful illustration even today. You know, this idea of the Gentiles, those who don't know the revelation, who live as though God does not exist, as though God has not revealed himself. And the point that the Lord is making here is this, that what he is teaching is totally different from the view of the Gentiles. It is totally different from anything that the world can bring. And we must never forget that. You see, the true Christian position, the true gospel, the true Christian life isn't just a, a slightly different version of what other people are about. It is something so different, so unique. It stands alone. It stands apart. It's vital that we understand that. 
you know that the gospel stands apart. It is utterly different. And one of the reasons why it is utterly different, secondly, is this, that the gospel points out that men and women are as they are by nature because of something that is deep and radically wrong. There is a major, major issue. And our Lord says, but seek ye first. And he is challenging all of his listeners. He's challenging you tonight. Where is the emphasis in your life? What is the first thing to you? He is concerned that you see what the true first thing should be. You know, if you speak with people, there are men who seem to think that what Christianity does is it points out just some of the, the minor flaws, you know? Minor flaws in man. That generally, man is, is good deep down. And uh, what he needs, he just needs a, a few pointers so he can iron out some of the flaws, but, but nothing too radical, you know? Just add a, a bit of religion, maybe start doing certain things, lay off some other things, but really nothing profoundly different, just a, a bit of surface work, no essential change. But the Lord says a message like that has got nothing to do with what he is preaching, what he is teaching, his message or his kingdom. And the Savior in his ministry used certain words constantly. And in our text it is first. What is first in your life? If it is something other than what he has laid out, then there is something radically wrong. He says, verse 21, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And he says very clearly in his teaching, he is ultimately saying this, look, my teaching is coming to deal with your heart. And that makes it different from everything else. It applies to your heart. The heart as in the spiritual, the very center of you, the center of your life and being. It's not just surface level. It goes to the very core of who you are, the centrality of who you are. Look at verses 22 to 23. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. So he uses this picture. And he says, look, it's through the eye that light enters into the body. The trouble comes right into the center of who we are. And true Christianity says that the trouble with men and women is at the very center of their being. Their understanding, their vision, their desire, the whole of them. It's not just that there's a, a minor flaw somewhere that needs to be ironed out through surface treatment. That's not the gospel. The Lord is saying that there is a fundamental problem with the heart. Our trouble is deep. Our trouble is profound. And so we need to be changed and changed totally and dramatically and changed to the very core of our being. That's what he says in John 3.3 3, when Jesus answered speaking to Nicodemus, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. If you're here tonight and you think Christianity is just a, a moral code to live by, you've missed it. That's not the gospel. The gospel is a radical power that transforms the individual, that makes new. It is the work of God in the life of an individual. And you know, the gospel points that out. It points out the need for this radical change and clear commitment. You can never be the same again. When God intervenes in your life, you're never the same again. Seek ye first. First. The gospel isn't just another point of view amongst many, not just something to be thrown around for discussion. It's a transformation. It's a way of life. It demands total commitment. You know, it's not saying, well, you know, look where your flaws are. Do the bits that apply to you. But, but don't worry about the other things, you know. Those things which are a little bit uncomfortable, don't worry about those. We show we don't understand the truth of Christianity if we think that we can... Pick and choose as we please. You know, you hear some people say, oh, well, I'm a, I'm a nominal Christian. What does that mean? 
There's no such thing as a nominal Christian. You either know Jesus Christ or you don't. You're either born again or you're not. You're either saved or you're not. You cannot be nominal. Matthew 16, 24. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And how often the Savior used that expression, follow me. What does it mean? It speaks of an abandonment of all other ways to follow him, to be focused upon him, a commitment to go after him. You see, the gospel is a divine message. It is unique that Jesus is the Son of God, that he's the only Savior of sinners, and that we must hear him and we must follow him. And his way exposes and cuts through all our ideas and it calls us to his way alone. And that he is the only one, the only one, who can deal with the fundamental problem of our troubled and sinful heart. Do you know, all through the passage that we read together, the Lord tells us that we have a wrong view of life. You know, look around you. Why is the world in trouble? Why is the world in so much difficulty? Why is everyone in the world not perfectly happy and contented and enjoying life to the full? Nobody would even try to dispute that this world is full of uncertainty and sorrow and pain and unhappiness. Why is that? Well, Jesus tells us that it is because by nature we have a wrong view of life. That's the trouble with the Gentiles. We do what we want to do. Forget about the consequences. Do what pleases you. And if our view of life is wrong, the way we live will be wrong. That's the point again of verse 23. If thine eye be evil, the whole body shall be full of darkness. If the focus is wrong, what then will be right? You know, you can tell a lot about a person when you look at their priorities in their life. Because for all the rhetoric, maybe for all the excuses, what we prioritize shows where our heart really is. And so let me ask you tonight, what are the things that you hold on to? Your priorities proclaim what you treasure. And by nature, we always put the wrong things first. And that's why people in this world, they have no time for God. No time for his word. No time for worship of God, for the Lord's day, for prayer. And so it goes on. By the way, it's a very sad thing when that is found amongst the Lord's people too. Remember what we prioritize proclaims what is precious to us you know people in the world they think they know what they need and so they look to these other things first so what are the priorities that they go after well our lord identifies them look at verse 19 lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal but it's what man does it's what man has always done Money, wealth, material possessions. It's almost always one of the main priorities with men and women. You know, if you have lots of money, you can get what you want and you'll be able to satisfy your needs. And some say money is power and all the rest. To control and to influence and to be able to buy happiness, that's the way of the world. Lay up for themselves treasures on the earth. Verse 21, where your treasure is, there Will your heart be also? Or verse 25. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? You know, food and drink, contrary to our Lord's teaching, men and women, they're very concerned about what they will eat and what they will drink and how much. And these for many people are the priorities. You look at the round and many are seeking happiness through especially things like drink and all that there. Clothing, what to wear, the latest fashion. And the way to happiness is about impressing people with image and with beauty to get the admiring looks. Money, food, drink, clothing. These are the things that people live for. And the point is this, he says, the tragedy of life is the reality that men and women are living and thinking and they're after all of these things and yet they have no regard for their eternal soul. No regard for their heart. 
All the thought, all the attention, all the priorities are in the realm of the body, in the realm of the flesh. And the world is living for temporal things, the immediate, the base desires. And maybe that's you here this evening. And then he says, verse 27, Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And Jesus says, look, which of you, by worrying, could add any length to the duration of his life? That's a priority of people too, isn't it? How can I prolong my life? What can I do? How can I add years? And and so we go on so many things. Are we living in terms of this existence alone? Because these things are what the Gentiles do. It's hard to deny it. You look at the world around you, this 21st century, and that's what we see. People living for this life, priorities around money and food and drink and clothing, extending their life, and that's it for them. And they say that's living. And our Lord says, it's totally wrong. It's the wrong view. And you say to me, well, why is it wrong? Why are these priorities wrong? Well, our Lord says that when we set these priorities, they always lead to bondage. Look at verse 24. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. That's where the gospel divides. It says you cannot serve both. It's not saying that money in itself is evil, nor food, nor drink. No, the condemnation comes when we are mastered by those things. Because you can't serve God and mammon. But people's view of life always leads to slavery to these things. Desire for more money. Desire for more eating, more drinking, more clothing. The need to keep up the grip of consumerism. Consumerism, by the way, which is ensnared the church the whole life is enslaved to these things and all the while they ignore their soul and look what he says in verses 25 to 28 he says these things lead to slavery and bondage and that always leads to anxiety he says i say unto you take no thought for your life what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. But you see people who live for these things, and they're anxious, and they're worried, that they might fall behind. They're afraid that they're going to lose what they have and what they created themselves. And then what will it be? They're terrified if they lose their money or their car or their wardrobe or all the rest. All the while, anxiety. And we live, don't we, in an apparent age of affluence and wealth. Yet like never before, it's an age of stress and strain and complex and tension. It's inevitable. And it bears out the truth of what our Saviour is saying. Continues to declare even now. You cannot have these things as masters. You cannot live for these things without being enslaved by them. And when you're enslaved to them, you're trapped in anxiety and worry and fear. And so our Lord says, look, you need to be given a right view of life. You need that transformation. And that is where the but comes in. He says, but don't be like that, but seek ye first. Seek ye first. Here are the true. Here are the eternal priorities. This is the emphasis of our Lord's teaching. In fact, it's the emphasis of the Scriptures. What are the things that we should pursue? Verse 25, he says, stop and consider who you are. Consider who you are. Verse 25, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, the body than raiment? Am I just a body? Or is there something different, something distinct, something more? Am I just flesh? No, you are made with an eternal soul. 
You're not here only to accrue wealth and eat and drink and to live for the body. You're more than that. You have a soul. Eternity is written on your heart. You are made in the image of God. And the Bible tells us that God made us in his image. And we've been endowed with reason and faculties and a soul. And there's something within you that cries out and yearns for more. That's what our Lord says, seek first the kingdom of God. You know, that's the priority. But what does he mean? It means that you realize that there is more to life than this. More to life than the externals. More than just this world in which we find ourselves in. There is a sense within me of more, of someone greater. You know, everyone has that sense. They might suppress it, but it's there. You know, it's why you had the Athenians with the altar to the unknown God. It's why you see people trying to cram their lives with so many things to try and quell that yearning. He says, seek first the kingdom and we must think on God. You know, he is the creator. He's the sustainer. He's the maker of all things. It's he who says, behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? It's the great doctrine of our God. That he is the sustainer, the provider, the God of providence in all eternal glory and power. But you talk to people, they don't want to think about God. They just want to concentrate on the here and now. They want to eat and drink and be merry and all the rest. But it's so foolish to neglect God. And what is worse, man is made to worship and must worship something. And so man has made gods for himself. Not the idols of ancient times necessarily, but idols of food and drink and money and clothing and achievements and possessions and, of course, self. People are designed to worship. And if they don't worship the one true and living God, then they will worship false gods of their own making. And the God who sustains the creation, they never consider. And the Lord says, it is madness. And it's sinful. And it's rebellious. You know, when a person considers himself and considers the reality of God, there will be that realization that we are utterly dependent upon him. Everything is dependent upon him. Psalm 100 verse 3. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Ah, times are in his hand. He brought us into being. He can end it in a moment. But men and women, they don't like to think like that, do they? The whole of life for them is without God. He doesn't enter their thinking. And that's why the world is as it is, says the Lord. Men and women have no thought of God. They don't humble themselves before him. You know, if the world had a right view of God, it would be a very, very different place. They do not understand. Maybe you don't understand that you live under the eye of almighty God. What does it mean then concerning the kingdom of God? Well, it means the reign of God. God is not only creator, but he is the ruler. And so we need to consider his rule. That he is righteous, that he is just, that he is holy, that he is perfect. That he made a perfect world, and yet sin has ruined it, but God does not change. And that one day he will put this world right. And he will bring in his kingdom, and this is what Christ declared, that he was bringing it. And it means whether we like it or not, we are under the eye of God, we are under his hand, and he is able to bless us in a manner that overwhelms us. So why don't we know those blessings? Well, God blesses the righteous. But as Romans 1.18 explains, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Christ declares that his kingdom is coming and has come. And God sent his son into the world to establish it and to found it. And he is gathering men and women into it. And the day approaches 
when the Son of God will return again and he will finally judge the whole world in righteousness and he will destroy his enemies, all who have not submitted to him, all who are not righteous. And as it says in 2 Thessalonians, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. You see, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, there is no room for evil. And when the kingdom of God has fully and finally come, evil will be banished. And all who find themselves in such will be dealt with similarly, and the righteous shall remain. Matthew 13, 43. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And so our Lord says, look, seek these things. Realize that you're made in the image of God. Realize that you live your life under God. Realize that the temporal things of this world will one day vanish. And when death approaches, they won't be of any interest to you. The Lord challenges us to live life with nothing as important as our relationship to God. The righteous, holy, sovereign, just God. The one who is the judge of the world. Who will establish his kingdom and all that is eternal. And Christ warns us to follow him and to seek that kingdom, to flee the wrath to come and to repent and believe the gospel. Why? Because we cannot avoid the righteousness of God and the coming kingdom and the reign of God. These are the priorities. This is what Christianity is about and it's unique. And the world will say, it's a nonsense. The world will say, laugh it off. Don't listen to such things. Go after the things that you think make you happy. But the gospel comes to you. And it warns you this night that life is uncertain. We do not know what tomorrow will bring. And so the most important thing is to be right with God. And so as we draw to a close, how can I be right with God? How can I know that I am in the kingdom of God? Well, our Lord says, seek it. Put everything else aside and seek this first and be urgent about it. Don't put it off. Luke 13, 24. Strive to enter in at the straight gate. But you know, you'll soon realize that you cannot make yourself righteous. You'll soon realize that you can't deal with your own sin. You may try for a while. You may try to live a holy life in your own strength. You might try to live out the Sermon on the Mount in your own strength, but it won't be long before you realize it's impossible. And as God works in your life and he begins to show, you will come to see that actually you cannot save yourself. You will come to see that you cannot change yourself. You cannot make yourself holy. And you will see that you are hopeless and helpless and full of sin. But you continue to seek the kingdom. And as you're brought to the end of yourself, the Lord Jesus Christ assures you that when this is your priority, all will be well. But you say, but how? You cannot enter the kingdom by your own strength. Your sin is a heavy burden. You're trying to seek, and yet you feel far away. That's when the words of Jesus come sweetly. Matthew eleven twenty eight, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. With all your load of sin, with all the darkness of your unregenerate heart, seeking and it all seeming in vain, you listen to his words. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. It's as though the Lord says, as one explains, come to me in all your desperation. You want to be righteous. You want to be right with God. You want to be in his kingdom. And you know you can't do it. But know this. I came in order to give you the righteousness that you cannot achieve for yourself. And I had to challenge you and convict you and urge you to seek. To show you how far off you were. The wrong direction that you were headed in. Your own sinful heart. Your total inability. And yet because I love you. I have come to satisfy God's law for you, to bear your punishment on the cross of Calvary so that your sins can be forgiven, so that your righteousness can be abolished, washed away, forgiven, cleansed in my blood, and let me clothe you 
with my own perfect spotless righteousness. And those who seek truly and earnestly moved of the Lord, they will find. And they will find. And what's the result? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. If you seek the kingdom of God, if you seek his righteousness, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God, your Savior, your Lord, the giver to you of his righteousness, then the Lord will satisfy the longings of your soul. He will satisfy you and you'll find rest and you'll know that your sins are forgiven and they're dealt with and they're cast into the depths of the sea and you'll know peace and joy. It's a glorious, glorious thing. When your sin is dealt with, nailed to the cross, you bear it no more. And what a knowledge to be right with God, peace with God. Romans 5, 1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And it goes on to say, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. It means that you are given knowledge, not only that you are forgiven, but that you are a child of God that you are a citizen of the blessed kingdom of God, that God is your father and that he loves you with a father's love. And as we said this morning, he has counted the very hairs on your head, that he is for you and he loves you and he will guide you and he will lead you and he will take you home. And it means that you will see life no longer with the wrong perspective of the world, but you'll see it with an eternal perspective and you'll no longer be enslaved to the things of the world. Yes, we have possessions. Yes, we eat. Yes, we drink. We have clothes. We're wise stewards of what the Lord has given to us, but we see things in the light of eternity and we hold them lightly. We don't live for these things. We're now more anxious to know God and to walk with him. We're more concerned that we are his children than amassing our treasures upon this earth. We're not worried about mixing with all the great and the good and the celebrity and all the rest. But you love to be with the lowest and the least if they're believers. And there's no place that you'd rather be. There's nothing like being in the company of the redeemed. You know, the view of this life is so different. And this world just becomes a pilgrimage to the glory that awaits. We see the sin of this world and it grieves us. We see this veil of tears, but we know that we're passing through, that we're not living for the here and now. And we say, as Philippians 3 says, our conversation is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. We're strangers and pilgrims in this world and heaven is our home. And if we are in the kingdom of God, we know that death is but a door through which we will pass to be immediately in the glorious presence of of our Saviour, and to see him, and to spend eternity with him. Words cannot even begin to express how wonderful that will be. We have been given an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. And it's all of his matchless, sovereign, amazing grace. Do you know these things? What are you seeking first? If you're in the kingdom of God through the grace of God that drew you to seek and to find, and you have his righteousness, the righteousness of Christ, you are secure in this life and the next. If not, then friend, you are in terrible, terrible danger, eternal danger. And I will plead with you that you would seek first this kingdom. Seek Christ. There is nothing that compares to knowing him. And when you know him, he will satisfy the longings of your heart. Amen.
We'll stand to sing together Psalm 4, and uh, we'll sing the entire of the psalm together. The tune is Evan, and the tune number is 61. thank thee for those lovely words which we have just sung together that the Lord when I on him do call to hear will not refuse we ask O Lord that thou wouldst be pleased to work these things upon our minds and hearts that we might know that we are right with thee for time and for eternity through the Saviour the Lord Jesus Christ and now may the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant Make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to him be glory for ever and ever. Amen. <laughs> 